This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you guys for joining us. We are Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm James Just. That's Richard Fields and John Cameron's down there on the other end. Gentlemen, um, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has passed since the last time we've been on the on the show. And sadly, it degenerated quickly into kind of political activism and this outpouring of emotion, which I don't actually understand the outpouring of emotion for a Supreme Court justice. If, if the Supreme Court is that important to your life, I think we've given the government too much power. But I suppose I can understand it. What do you guys feeling on this well I, you're right that we've given the supreme court way too much power government in general way much too much power over our lives but i can certainly understand the uh the grief particularly among women on the passing of uh, justice uh, ginsburg she was a a longtime champion of uh, women's rights uh was a, a person who ruled correctly in the uh, legalization of, uh, of gay marriage uh, she was a person who was the wrote i think the majority opinion on the uh um, ending the Virginia Military Institute as a, uh, a bastion, a, a male-only institution, which is a state-run state, uh, school in, in Virginia. Uh, on civil liberties, she generally came down on the, on the libertarian side in, in a pretty significant way. And she was certainly somebody that uh, women in particular were, uh, were, were had, a, had a very deep, kind of an emotional bond with. And so I understand it from that aspect. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. And she was a, a hero of my daughter. You know, the whole reproductive rights thing um, is, is, is a, you know, if you're looking at it from an intellectual perspective, you know, the, the um, right to life folks, um, you know, see, see uh, a fetus as a, as a, a soul and, and a human and, and the, the, right to choose folks see it is not and and you they you know can't get past that but you know all the i think unless they're very conservative religious women um most of the women i know see rbg as uh you know as a hero uh she was uh on civil liberties which we're we're all as libertarians very strong on she was very good. Um, she was she was not so good on property rights, and she was certainly not good on Second Amendment. Um, but um, you know, just for example, uh, when it when it comes to process, due process, which is important, you know, she actually said not that long ago that the Title IX stuff, where you know guys were being basically uh, tried and executed for for hearsay without the ability to do a jury trial or cross-examination or anything needed to be looked at. So, so she was pretty hardcore on the civil liberty side. Although I think, you know, sometimes you start believing your own press. Um, she was sick for an awfully long time and she was, I'm not saying non compass menace, but you know, she nodded out during court decisions left and right. She nodded out, um, to long enough for a, a uh, an artist in the Supreme Court because they don't allow cameras in because they don't want them seeing this kind of thing to to sketch a take a very good sketch of her uh, sleeping, and this is during the Supreme Court trial. So um, probably the smart thing for her to do would have been to retire during the Obama administration so that. Um, you know, they would have had a, a pretty good shot at replacing her, you know, politically with another liberal judge. And I hate, I really hate the idea that we have to label everything liberal and conservative because, you know, now following the Constitution is somehow conservative and not following it is somehow liberal or progressive. And Constitution's a Constitution. So I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, if, if you're not happy with it, uh, instead of, of you know, uh, basically violating the principles of law that the country's founded on, then the Congress should get some grow a pair and, and change the damn thing. But, you know, that's not going to happen. And she, her, her, you know, I mean, hats off to her, 
you know, her ability to fight and all the rest of that. But, you know, basically she bet on um, by not retiring when she was very ill before because she's battled cancer off and on for, what, 27 years, I think. That at some point, if she if she wanted to make sure that her viewpoint was carried on in the court, she should have retired under a Democratic president, and, and she didn't choose to. You do know, that. I, so, I, I I object. I I, I, I I'm a personally offended by your reference to nodding off in court as a uh, a sign of uh, decline. I uh, nodded off in sales meetings when I was in my 30s and 40s, so mm-hmm. I don't think that counts. Uh, well, no, when I mean, you have I to do, listen to a bunch of lawyers moving on. You nod uh, off but, in, in sales meetings in your 50s and 60s, too, because I witnessed yeah, I know. it. And, you know, I'd try to wake you up. And I, yeah. I know, but, the, the but point, if you're the point paid is, the point to is, make you have a to listen to boring lawyer, boring, boring lawyer talk, that's, that'll put anybody to sleep. Uh, yeah. That said, I think that it's really important to uh, note that her body is not even uh, cool yet. And Democrats and Republicans are already jockeying over who her replacement will be. Uh, the uh, the president has said that he'll have an announcement on a replacement nominee by this Friday, the uh, 25th or something like that, mm-hmm. and uh, he uh, you know obviously will have the support of a, uh, some Republicans, certainly not all, uh, that uh, of going ahead and, and getting the position filled way before before the election uh, or if necessary in a lame duck section a session of the of the uh, of the senate uh it's interesting to note though that at least two republican senators have come out against uh going forward this quickly mm. primarily because uh when the uh, shoe was on the other foot the democrats nominated garland and he did not get a hearing uh, with much uh, a much longer time uh, before the end of the administration, of the Obama administration. But both uh, Murkowski of Alaska and Collins of Maine have said that they're not going to vote for a replacement this soon. That leaves only uh, a margin of one in the Senate for getting a Republican-approved uh, uh, Supreme Court nominee, either before or after the election, before, uh, before Inauguration Day. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out politically. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to uh, the libertarian uh, presidential candidate George Argenton will be coming out with a uh, a very different and a very uh, much superior list of Supreme Court nominees in the next few days. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I was hoping for uh, you know the fact that he's he's eager to nominate another woman. I didn't see a woman on that list with with experience. You know, his two supposed prime candidates are very inexperienced jurists. Uh, they don't have a, a lot of. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm not saying they're not qualified, but it doesn't seem like they they carry a lot of weight. Uh, the the two things that that uh, Richard and I argue constant or not argue, but we talk constantly about. Uh, um, you know Trump and and the things he does wrong and the things he done right and you know, two things he's done right are reduced regulation and. And appoint some pretty good judges, but I think that that he's the these two choices that I've seen just kind of don't leave me too excited. Um, who is the the guy before Gorsuch um, that he? Uh, oh, he's, well, Trump's he's, two picks for Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Yeah, so Gorsuch, Gorsuch, super, super, super strong. Uh, Kavanaugh, good, but there were probably, you know, better candidates out there. Uh, and these two just strike me as, as being a little weak. Now, what do you think, Richard? Well, I, I don't know that much about them, and, and I don't care. I, I'm interested in the, uh, the liber- uh, nominating libertarian uh, candidates uh, to yeah. as justice. Yeah. Now, well, what strikes me about Ginsburg was she was kind of one of those, that era where you could actually have honorable disagreements. Her and Scalia were famously she was good friends with Alito and Scalia, even though she was polar opposite uh, ideologically. Yeah, politically opposite, but you know, honorable people can have honorable disagreements. They can go out. You can be best friends while still being vastly political different. And I think if there's one lesson we can learn from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is that is that you can be vastly politically different while still being honorable and friendly and. You know, your best friend can be someone who is completely different than you. You don't have to completely disassociate yourself with somebody because they have a 
a different view of how the world should go. You don't I, have to I, do that. I absolutely agree. And I think this just shows, even though I, I, I think the two parties, are, you know, you can't separate them with the width of a razor blade and, and their real attitude toward, you know, the, the, the populace and, and, the, and the role of big government. But if you look at the history of this thing, you know, the Supreme Court justices, no matter if they were conservative or progressive or liberal or whatever, if they were strongly qualified up until not that long ago in our past, would get almost uh, unanimous approval, no matter what the makeup of the Senate was. If they were strongly qualified and the president put them up there, they would get approved. And then, you know, that started to change. And then there was a radical change. And I think it was the, the Democrats that led the charge in it, not that the Republicans are any better, basically, in, in fighting to, to politicize the Supreme Court. And then the Republicans followed suit. And now we have the horror show that we have. Um, and I don't think the Constitution actually says anywhere in it that the Senate needs to confirm those people. Um, yeah, it does. It does. It doesn't say what the process is. It used to be two thirds. That was yeah. narrowed down to uh, sixty percent, and now down to fifty percent. So it's yeah. that, and that's you know that's as a re, as a result of of the uh, highly partisan nature of, of nominations. Yeah. But anyway, I'm I'm my my daughter was you know I mean, she's a staunch feminist and she was devastated by it. And, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of people we know are in the same boat. And, you know, I mean, again, the, you know, this idea that everything, that, that there, there's, two, there's only two sides and one's liberal and one's conservative, and I hate the labels on both of them, is absolutely, you know, the nonsense that's causing this, this country to crash. I mean, the, the, our, our founding fathers didn't say there's going to be two parties and they're going to be the Republicans, and they're going to be the Democrats, and they're going to be exactly the same except for one or two issues, and they're going to fight tooth and nail over everything. And, most, you know, most, where's the well, Let me just part? throw out a couple, it's throw, out some of the, throw out some of the libertarian names under consideration. This is not an official list or anything, but names under consideration. Nadine Strawson used to be the head of the uh, ACLU before it went uh, hard left. Janice Rogers Brown uh, on the uh, appellate court in D.C., Clint Bollock, who is a Supreme Court judge in Arizona and actually won, ran, ran for, for a state assembly as a libertarian back in the day when he was going to law school. A friend of ours, uh, you and I, John, Anastasia Bowden, uh, Eugene Volek, Dan, Don Willett, Randy Barnett, Nathan Turley, Timothy Sandifer, uh, Jacob Hornberger, Alan Dershowitz is somebody who is more or less above the fray. Those are the kind of people that should be considered and, uh, and will be by uh, a libertarian candidate. Hmm. So, uh, you know, a less partisan issue where we can get some more balance into our judiciary. But speaking mm -hmm. of balance, um, Department of Justice formally declared New York City an anarch anarchist jurisdiction. And apparently they're so Trump's trying to cut off some federal money to New York. What is it? Seattle and Portland, I think. Yeah, if, if New York, remember. Washington State, uh, Oregon. And what was the other one? Places where they've they've defunded their their police and are basically, you know, have uh, looting and rioting going wild. And, and I, I, I think the, the uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think if you poll police officers, somebody did a poll a while back and asked them uh, what um, their primary mission was. And, um, you know, it's to basically serve and protect and most of them answered, keep order. And so, uh, you know, I don't care if, if there's order, but I certainly care if there's looting. Uh, and and uh, I certainly care if people fear for their lives. And, and if you, I think if you poll, Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, or James, correct me if I'm wrong. If you poll minorities, a vast majority of minorities do not want there to be fewer policemen. They just want the policemen to leave them alone when they're when they're trying to bootstrap themselves up and not hassle them over minor infractions of, of regulations and not laws, which is why cops are bogged down. But they certainly want their property, their little property that they actually have protected. And they want their lives protected. So, 
I don't know. You know, it's another, it sounds to me like another political farce, but what the hell? Well, the, the thing about, you know, the, the uh, Trump withholding federal funds to uh, states for not following his uh, political predilections, it, you know, it, it, question, it brings into question the whole idea of federal funds. Here's yeah. what happens. The uh, taxpayers across the country are taxed up the kazoo to uh, bring money into the federal treasury. And then the federal treasury takes a cut off the top, a very large cut, and gives uh, a, pr a very small percentage back to the states as a bribe to follow Washington policies rather than uh, policies that the people in the state would prefer to follow. This happens in education, know. it's now happening in law enforcement, any number of different areas where the Fed it happens in medical care, a whole lot, a lot of areas where the Fed is essentially using uh, using our, our money to blackmail our state governments into doing what the majority of uh, senators and congressmen in, or the, the administration in the, in the federal government wants to, 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 to have happen. That's, that's upside down. There should be no federal funds. There should be no uh, ability for the federal government to bribe or cajole or any other way influence what state governments do. It should be the states doing what they and their citizens want uh, of course, according you know, following libertarian principles, and likewise at the federal level. No, I yeah. absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I got a little sidetracked, and I think you can you can track. Think you can pretty much track the money given back to states in all areas: defense spending, ag, everything else, uh, and whether the the state is rewarded or punished. Uh, in the percentage, whether it's less money than it sends to the Fed or more money than it sends to the Fed, based upon its towing the line of which other, whichever despot is in power in the Emerald City. So, um, you know, California for years up through the Reagan era um, was uh, uh, a big trotters in the trough state got a lot more money back from or from the fed than it than it sent and then that flipped uh and got a lot less and i think now that it's uh i think during the obama years if you would track the numbers with um you know it probably got a little bit more because it was voting the party line but you were absolutely right shouldn't be taking our money and and then uh, you know that's that's as bad as government schools where they force you to put your kids in school take money from you so they can brainwash them wash you to give them more money i mean this is all crazy stuff it's crazy stuff it's it's kind of you know maybe the world's going to catch on fire because it's so crazy well know? we've no. given the administrations whether it's trump or uh even local administrations so much power over where the spent the money the assembly is supposed to assemblies or congress are supposed to tell where the money goes but yet they don't they say well here it goes to this agency and this agency gets to decide where the money goes and since the agency is run by you know the executive branch they get to decide where the money goes we see the same thing here happening at state levels if counties don't tow the state line on coronavirus issues they get their funding pool and so yeah, no it's it's uh, it's it's all uh, money coming from the citizenry going up to a higher level of uh, government and then uh, the the local people having uh, their choices taken away from them happens at the state level as well as the federal level absolutely yeah and the nomenclature make all the decisions and and uh you know that's it's it's we're we're turning into the soviet union so the these people that are in power in these uh patently unconstitutional independent regulatory agencies that are judge jury and executioner have Date way more day to day power over over people than than you know I mean kings used to and there's nothing you can do about it and it's just yeah I mean the, the conspiracy theorists uh, you know call it the deep state well it's it's a real thing it's really the administrative state uh, the administrative state as you point out has the ability not only or has been delegated by Congress or by state uh, legislatures the power to write regulations i.e. write laws. Uh, and then uh, judge whether the laws are being followed or not, and then uh, fine or punish folks who don't uh, follow the laws that were never passed in by the legislature in the first place. Yeah, uh, we we're you know we anyway we could go example after we example. Could go example. I'd like us, I know I know we were I think we we're going to talk something about we'll blast something over that's warm in my heart. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Which, oh, I don't. We're gonna get there. We want to go there. All right, we'll go. We'll strike right to the, the fires. We've been all experiencing fires, and it's kind of the smoke is finally kind of cleared up. Is it climate change, or is it resource management, or is it a bit of both? I know, John, you're itching to sit here and talk about this, and I can see it in your face. <laughs> um, I'm just itching because of that, because of all the wounds from making some bad decisions on a hike I went on and getting lost. And yeah, I'm itching to talk about this one. Well, I think, uh, I, you know, yes, there, there have been, uh, we've had some drought and we've had some really, really hot years. And, and quite frankly, I don't think it really matters if it's climate change or not, because there are some things that can be done and were done and are done in other places irrespective of climate change, that would make a huge difference. But, and here's where I'm really going to make our thousands of viewers a little upset, some of them. I think it's intentional on the part of the nomenclatura to not solve the problem or fix the issue and have the forest burn so that they can basically um, strong arm, intimidate, and threaten people into giving up more and more power to the state to fix the problem. And uh, there, there are forestry practices that have been practiced for hundreds of years, thousands of years if you count Native Americans, and in a, currently in other places that would, and there's no argument that anybody can make that this is wrong, would cut down on the fire danger. That's getting the 162, 163 million, give or take a million dead trees out of the forests. That's doing controlled burning. Uh, that's allowing people to, uh, you know, create fire barriers around their homes. Um, and that's actually preventing these huge fires rather than fighting them. And so what you see is our government in California, especially here, has spent a fortune beeping up Cal Fire. And why? I'm not saying just because there are more union people employed in government to put out the fires and hardly anything on preventing those fires. And the regulations actually prevent an intelligent use of methodology that will prevent it. It takes longer to get a permit approved to remove fire damaged trees, which can be milled and turned into lumber or turn into other wood products, then the trees are viable after a fire. You can't tell me that's not intentional. And I, think, uh, you I think you can do one simple, uh, make one simple statement that uh, kind of explains the whole thing. Something well over 90% of the forest land in California is owned by the federal federal government, either the Forestry yeah. Service or the Bureau of Land Reclamation uh, or uh, other federal agencies, uh, a significant part of the rest is owned by the state. And it's on those public lands where the fires are taking place. Privatize the forests, make them something that are owned by timber companies, owned by individuals, owned by people who have a stake in making sure that there aren't fires and the fires will largely the, the devastating fires will largely end. Uh, the, we didn't have the, those kinds of uh, devastating burns during the time when the Indians were managing the forests. They would start fires in order to drive the deer out of the woods, but there were never any devastating fires that I'm, that I'm aware of through history. Uh, likewise, when you harvest timber and get rid of the underbrush, you, you, you eliminate the need for or the uh, possibility that fires can burn out of control like they have been over the last uh, 50 years or so. So the, the, the problem is not climate change per se or management. It's, it's management and the fact that the management is being done by people who have no economic or vested interest whatsoever in making sure that, that forests are well managed for both recreation and for lumber and for the the good of uh, of, the, of society and, and and for their individual owners, mm -hmm. uh, privatize the forest, problem goes away. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, absolutely yeah. agree. Well, I think there's there's two questions. We've got the question of learning how to live cleaner over time, which I think there's nobody who disagrees with that, right? Figuring out how to live a cleaner lives is a good thing. Wanting wanting society to be cleaner is a good thing. It's kind of a universal agreement, but also managing the the mitigating 
the risks that our wild lands and brush fires and forest fires have. We know how to mitigate the risks. We know how to put in pre pre-built fire breaks. We know how to pre-build fire access roads. We know how to buy more helicopters so you can actually get there quicker. Instead of having a bunch of on the ground people, we can get a quick response fire helicopters so they can actually get some water on the on the ground right at the start but none of that even matters if you don't do the management of the underbrush you don't take care of the dead trees you don't take care of the beetle problem which is caused by an overcrowded forest issue there's all kinds of things that we don't think about mm -hmm. because we want to save johnny polar bear in 30 years but we've got our fire problem now mm -hmm. And, and then so the, the, the Richard brought up a very good point, and which was the, the, the in on the East Coast, you don't see these kind of devastating fires except on occasion on public lands. And the reason you don't is because most of the forests in the South and the East uh, are privately owned, and Absolutely. so people take care of them. And the four you don't see these kind of devastating fires on. There are millions and millions of acres this i think the second largest uh um what's the name of the company there is used to be red anderson i think his sons are, are uh running it now the big timber companies out, out of redding they own millions and millions of acres of of timber and you don't see this kind of devastating fire on their land why because they take care of it but you do see um I mean, they're, they're, that company has uh, some of the very few permits for tule elk because of all the land they own. You do see wildlife thriving. Why? Because it is an ecosystem and people have gotten away of it. I mean, again, last thing, we should probably move on because I can go on about this for hours and we got like two minutes. So I'll, I'm going to stop. You've got about 40 <laughs> seconds. So you can go on and continue. Sell you got 30 it. seconds, John. <laughs> Sell it to people who have a vested interest in it, and that's people like you and me. I'll buy some forest. You betcha I would. I like trees. I don't like, like to watch them burn. And then do the same things that people have been doing to prevent this kind of crap for literally <laughs> thousands of years. I mean, it's simple. And so the only reason we are not doing it is because the nomenclatura have a vested interest in using this stuff for political means which is to make people fearful enough to turn over their lives to them, prevent forest fires that the Indians prevented for thousands of years with very simple techniques. And we're going to end on that from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint. We thank you for watching. You can catch us at libertariancounterpoint.com. You can do us a search on your favorite social media outlet and find us at, what is it, Gail Morgan on YouTube. And give him a like. He always appreciates that. Thank you for your time. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.